Thanks very much, Ewan, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Ewan uh, said I've been around mental health. Uh, he didn't say how long my career was, but it's been too long. Uh, probably about 35 years, and as a consequence, my knowledge and understanding of the whole issue of digital apps, e-mental health, comes from the side of mental health services. Uh, my interest in this has come about because of all the things I've seen in the last uh, three decades or so. This, to me, is exciting, not just because it's a nice thing to have, but because it's potentially transformational. So I think this is something I'm, I would like to share with you, my ideas about why it could be transformational for mental health, and therefore, de facto, very good business, hopefully, for those of you who want to move into this area, while at the same time making a very strong case for the, the need to overcome some complexities which are largely within the responsiveness of the healthcare system and its ability to do things and how working like this, I think, hopefully should enable us to do this more effectively. So, if we start out, Mental health used to be seen of as a sort of sideline issue, something that was, you know, a bit marginal to real life. Um, within the last 10 years, it is widely accepted that one in four of us will experience a major mental health problem at some point in their life. There is nobody in this room who does not know somebody or has not personally experienced a major mental health issue. That's just the way it is and we will all know somebody like that. And we will also perhaps know that there is a huge amount of it out there, but what we offer to people is not necessarily very well received. We do spend a large amount of money spend on providing care, but traditional models very often don't seem to meet the need. The modal prescription of antidepressants is one. People go along, present, get a prescription written, which they may or may not cash, and if they do cash, they may or may not take it. So what we've got is a, is a major issue, and that's for psychotropic medication. It's true for many other forms. We have introduced, I was party to the group who introduced improving access to psychological therapies, which by and large have been reasonably well received, but a very significant proportion of those people who go forward and are offered it decline it or go for one session and not a lot. So there's a grouping of people out there who are struggling to get the support they want, not because they don't need it, because it's been identified that they've got problems. But the way in which we currently provide them, combined I think very often with the level of stigma that's associated with mental health of people's general difficulties of acknowledging that, is a problem. What we then need to do is look about, well, almost anything that adds to this and adds to the range of choice, the range of availability, that makes it more acceptable for people to use and seek help in a particular way, I think is very important. Those of you who are involved directly in the mental health world know that there has been, I think, a very positive response to a large number of, of the digital and e-developments that have come out. And that, that positive response has been very often from groups of people who historically wouldn't have come near our services, from veterans, from young men, from people who, even if there was a service there to offer it to, wouldn't have been terribly interested. So we're expanding. And it's come about at a time when we're also having an experiencing a growing interest of people managing their own health care. The notion that somehow or other we have to wait to get ill and then the state looks after us is no longer seen to be very sensible in, in almost any health condition and as much in mental health, but therefore you need something else. Another very important element, and you'll hear part of that probably I suspect later this afternoon from some of our colleagues, is the idea that, it is, that this is something that with the right support, people can support each other. There is again a very long history in mental health of people offering support to people who have experienced similar problems. So in other words, we help to deprofessionalize, destigmatize and move it away. So there's a, a very good case, if you like, for moving in this direction. However, despite that, all, we've got all these demographic things, we've got 
consumer pressures, we've got economic pressures, the government drivers. This should lead to an interest in the use of products, and it has, but not sufficiently at this point. And I think what we've got, by and large, is a rather patchy adoption of e-mental health products. And I think that is something that we need to think about today, because in taking this forward, you can have no point in having wonderful products if nobody is actually going to be able to access them. So we've got a market out there that we think would, would welcome them. We've got a large number of people who've got some very interesting things. But we seem to have commissioners and providers. And Ewan mentioned procurement. It's not just about procurement. If people don't even want to put out a spec for it, who don't even know what it is they should be procuring, who don't know how to do that, we need to create a climate where that can be different, where that can be changed. And I think we need to address that. And we've got, I'll talk a bit more about some of the, the, the difficulties I think are there, but a, a low level of awareness. It's as if everything that is happening in the digital and app world is happening over there. In physical health, it appears to be getting a bit more centralised. So the discussion, what Ewan was saying, somebody walking onto the ward doing things, people knocking up their own stuff. In mental health, it isn't there yet, with some notable exceptions of some exceptional professionals who've got in there and started doing it. So I think what we need to do is to try and do that. We also hit, and this comes back to accountability, quality processes. The first reaction of most people in this field, if presented with something new that they don't understand, is to identify risk. It's a very good reason of blocking it, of course, but the reality is very often we do not, it's, 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 you can throw it up, and you can say this is being very protectionist, and it is, but it's also very often because if there isn't some reasonable spec, nice guidelines or whatever you can hold this against, then it's very hard and people say, oh, well, what happens if something goes wrong? And of course, that then organisations and the NHS is unbelievably risk averse, tend to do the first thing, which is to say, oh, we don't know if it works or how, if it works or what would happen if we had a problem. So in terms of the barriers, of three system barriers, three barrier levels of barriers, lack of professionals. Uh, well, lack of awareness. I suspect as many, if not more, people who use mental health services are familiar with the products that are out there. It is not part of the curriculum. It is not what people learn to use. People are not trained to think about this. And I think we need to think significantly differently about how we change that. There are those concerns about accountability and about governance. What if I use this and something goes wrong? But there's also, I think, a perceived threat to professional power. Now, I say that as somebody who comes from one of the smallest and most precious of all professions. Uh, professions, as George Bernard Shaw reminded us, are at their heart a conspiracy against the laity. And the practical reality is all professions are resistant to any change that threatens them. And if somebody comes along and says this app or this particular product can potentially uh, do what you've done. We're no different from the Luddites who wanted to smash the machines. We have to think and accept that if a, if a system can do something I can do, but better and more efficiently, maybe I should be doing something else, or maybe there are other things I could be doing. At an organisational level, we have the same, but probably a greater lack of awareness, because of, with a few notable exceptions, I. I'm a trustee of the Tavistock and Portman and one of the products, uh, we are in a joint venture with Big White Wall. Now, that is very unusual. Sarah, who you will hear later this afternoon, again, her trust is actively bought into this and it sees itself as something they want to do. But a lot of them don't even know what's out there and block out their minds to these things. And again, I would suggest to you there are vested interests at play here because they perceive these things to be a, a to be a potential threat to their business models. So the market diversification that comes, because if you or anybody else comes along and says, I have this product, which is actually a very effective way of helping people manage their depression or deal with some of the issues relating to their um, psychosis or any other mental health issue, this could be seen as a threat. 
if we are not controlling it because we're all, we're putting it out in a different way. It seems to me that it is not necessarily a threat. We can on to that, but it's an initial reaction. At a systemic level, I mean, got at the healthcare system overall. Again, a limited understanding. Very good in some places. Said other people will tell you about places they can go where people can't get enough of this. But also, I think a lack of openness. Now, the paradox is that the NHS is under huge pressure to save money. It's under huge pressure to reorganise itself down, to spend less on professionals. Yet, in doing this, the pressures it's under almost inevitably produces a lack of innovation. Because when people are under pressure, they stop innovating. So we, we're struggling with a paradox here that is not insuperable, but it needs to be overcome. So what are my suggestions about some of the ways of addressing these barriers to change? Firstly, it seems to me ludicrous that we are not building training about how to use digital and other products into our core mental health training. If we build it in, we overcome a lot of the fears, a lot of the anxieties. We also get to a point where uh, many of the people would actually start to recognize that they, they, their continuing skills are relevant. I don't regard my or anybody else's skills as irrelevant just because something can do something better. I can then do something else. With those skills, I also think that if we do have, and I think there is a real risk if we don't address what you said, if somebody will invent a whole totally new and different set of governance standards here, which are not any different than the underlying problems. I think we need, at an organisational level, to persuade people that this is not about trying to pinch their business. Sadly, there's too much business for all of us. This is about diversifying, and we have new populations. The vast majority of mental health trusts, the NHS providers of services, do touch probably about 10% of those people with mental health problems. The rest are dealt with in primary care and get a combination of either uh, psychotropic medication, which in some cases is very good and very necessary. In other cases, they will get maybe access to psychological therapies. Now, I, as I say, I'm very proud to be part of the system that set up access to psychological therapies in this country, improved access, but it's improving to a target of 15% of the population who've got them. In other words, we're not starting with an expectation there's a hell of a lot more people out there who need this and whom we need to invest in different ways. And I suppose what I'm suggesting to you that this can help us access and support new populations of people. And if we can't appeal to ultras, and we could maybe appeal to this as a, bit, as a business model. There's a lot of people out there who would benefit from it. I think the other thing that is often lost here is how e-mental health can increase user engagement. And again, there will be people speaking about this later today who will talk about it much more coherently than I can. But it does strike me that because most of the products that we now have available have been developed, have been co-produced, then I think we're in a much better position uh, to uh, show that these are things that people are interested in and willing to use because they get a chance to shape, or they or their colleagues get a chance to shape and develop them. So, at a systemic level, that's within the NHS as a whole, there is a risk here that, and in a way, having a special session on mental health has a reinforces that the mental health is somehow or other different. Well, yeah, it is, but it also isn't. The vast majority of people with mental health problems have physical health problems. In fact, they not only have them, with those with severe mental health problems die of the physical health problems up to 25 years earlier because people don't pay much attention to them. <laughs> Um, equally, however, people with long-term, people with physical health problems have mental health conditions. No great surprise there. So people with coronary heart disease, people with uh, COPD, all these tend to have fairly high levels of depression. And they predict not only uh, morbidity, but mortality. And it does strike me that being realistic, uh, people with long-term conditions are going to get a lot more interest in the short term from the NHS than people with mental health problems. Not how it should be, not what the government says it's going to do under parity of esteem, but a bit like what it is. 
GPs see huge numbers of people with long-term conditions as well as huge number of people with mental health, they tend to feel the need to do something about those with long-term conditions. And I think if we work with the other parts of the system, and that's why I think the fact that uh, <coughs> Handy is working across all systems and not as just a, a narrow mental health or physical health provider, then I think we must look at the value and how we enhance the value and, and reduce pressure on existing systems. Again, it would be nice to appeal to altruism. You're going to see later this week, you will see that the, it's been trailed in the papers over the weekend, the appalling crisis that is in the NHS. People are dying. Well, frankly, people have been dying for quite a long time. Some of the things that are happening are appalling. But what you're seeing is a political front, and this is another party's political issue, this is going to be done by all political parties, to drive things in a particular way. We've got to have a stronger argument to help address these things and ensure that mental health is part and parcel of the process. So yes, we need to appear to altruism, but also we need to focus on reducing pressures on the existing systems. GPs, we're not going to have enough GPs, we're told. Uh, we're going to have massive pressures on A&E. Many of the people who go to GPs, a third of the people who go to GPs will go with primarily mental health problems. Lots of people who turn up at A&E, particularly those who've got comorbid physical health systems, will be turning up because of that. So we must show how we can add to that. So, how do we go about it? Well, I'm well aware that this is an incredibly competitive business, but as uh, as Ewan said, competition and collaboration uh, can exist, in fact have to exist, because if somebody is coming to me talking about products, a particular product, I think, well, you would say that because you want me to buy this product. If a community is talking about the potential, the transformational potential of this approach, well, which will contain all existing current products, but a lot of others as well as that, then I think I'm more likely to listen, and I think that's true across the board. I do think we've got a huge strength here. Uh, people with mental health problems have historically felt very uh, disempowered and disengaged, and I think uh, in getting the good marketing is you work with people who are going to use the stuff, you develop it with them. That is how you can do it. You can increase engagement and satisfaction and constantly be tuning it to make it work. And again, you will hear examples of how that has been done from colleagues later this afternoon. I think we do need to align. We have, I mean, I've maybe been rather disrespectful to uh, the, the professions, but there are some fantastic people out there who want things to be different. Very often, they don't understand, however, how the technology works. If they did, they probably wouldn't be in that business. And again, handy by bringing together professionals who've, who've got an idea with people who are technology specialists, I think is a, a great way forward. I won't labour the common standards, but let's get there. So let's kill that for once and for all, because if we don't have some sort of standard, we're going to get hammered. Um, creating the roots of a social movement may feel a little bit 60s, and I'd like you at this point to all imagine you and wearing a caftan and floating through here. I remember it well. I actually have photographs of it somewhere, which I tried to find for this presentation. Um, but very often, we're in a position where market, we're being told it's very hard market, it's all about money. I think the social movement, there is a whole literature that shows that social movements can make things happen when they're based on promoting collaboration, mutual benefits, and I think that's why I like the approach, and I like working in an approach where people come together, and it doesn't stop you competing when you're competing for particular things, but you actually think, how do we shape this? Because otherwise, we're not going to shape and influence the market in which we exist. It's creating a market presence to enable people who use services to get a better deal for our friends, our families, and ourselves. So, that's uh, where I'm contactable, but I'm very happy to take any questions if we've got time.